Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would also like to thank Fergus very much for the very kind and generous introduction. And of course, my fellow um, people on the, pla on the panel for allowing me to be here this evening on the podium. Uh, most of all, last but not um, least, I would like to thank the Royal Geographical Society itself for the great pr privilege and the honor it is to actually be in this most esteemed venue. And I'm quite aware of people who have spoken here before. Um, and on a very personal note, I'd like to share a little confidence um, with you. You know, growing up um, in Belgium as a little girl, in the Ardennes, in the forests, whatever, my brothers used to regale me with these most fantastic stories about these great um, British heroes, the explorers, whatever. And I didn't speak any English at the time. I couldn't read it, I couldn't understand it, but it didn't really matter. Um, or the names like Scott and Shackleton, they were household names in my home um, in Belgium. And so being mindful of what um, a quote that's very often attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. Um, basically, if I here um, tonight on this podium uh, see any further, it is because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And it is in this spirit that I would actually like to um, speak with you tonight. So on to the topic that's basically on the agenda. And my apologies for actually having to read it to you because it's quite a mouthful, even for me. So the topic is, can society strike a balance between combating the dangers of viral outbreaks and pandemics while maintaining the hopes of eradicating established diseases such as malaria and HIV? Well, you know, um, that is not the, in global health. That is not the real question to me. It's also not the real question to the 1,700 volunteer medical professionals um, that work for me. It is also not the real question for the five billion people on four continents that we attempt to serve. Because in the end, what is the point trying to strike a balance between uh, combating new viral outbreaks and pandemics or whatever, and trying to eradicate existing diseases when ultimately 75% of people on the planet do not have access to primary healthcare delivery platforms that allow them to access the medications or the vaccines or whatever remedies we come up with with our... Oh, sorry. And whatever remedies science comes up with, basically. So that, to us, um, is the real question. And so if that is, if you um, look at it, you know, from a point of view of established diseases, for instance, take South Africa. Um, South Africa, everyone knows, it is the most industrialized economy on the entire continent of Africa. South Africa is also the country that has received tens of billions of pounds over the past 15 years uh, in medical aid. South Africa still has in some of its areas an HIV AIDS prevalence rate of 26%. And yet, in this whole context, at the end of November 2011, so three months ago, two months ago, the government in Eastern Cape province in South Africa destroyed 19 tons of critically needed medication. And why? The reason is because they couldn't get them to the patients that needed them. So if this is happening for established diseases in a place that is, is the industrialized economy on the African continent, uh, for established diseases, surely it's not going to be any different for the new ones that we are trying to combat. And even the new pandemics that are breaking out, the vast majority of people, they're not dying necessarily from SARS or avian flu or anything like it. The vast majority of people now are dying because of chronic disease epidemics, of cardiovascular problems, of diabetes, of COPD, of hepatitis, chronic hepatitis B and C, and so on. In China, the, the death rate um, 
do to chronic diseases is, um, of all the people dying, it's more than 82%. Um, and if you look at a place, for instance, like Vietnam, to just stick with a, a new pandemics now, uh, you look like a place like Vietnam. It's the second fastest growing economy in Asia, has 90 million people, so take the entire population of the UK and add on another 50%. Um, a little less known fact is that it has the highest growth rate of diabetes in the world right now. An estimated 18% of the population has diabetes. Uh, that's about 18 out of 90 million. That's about 18 million people, something. Um, and the entire country has 85 doctors who know how to diagnose it, leave alone how to treat the disease. So in this, to us, what is the point of trying to um, strike a balance between going after new pandemics or um, trying to still eradicate the old ones if ultimately you don't have a platform where patients can go and actually get the medications or get the vaccines. Um, does a solution exist? Yeah, of course, it does. And a solution is, in essence, it is um, primary healthcare delivery platforms for five billion people that are sustainable, that provide affordable quality care, and that are viral in their operational efficiency. And now, I'm not speaking out of utopia. Um, I'm not making this up. Um, there is actually a beautiful, and it's one of my most favorite uh, field anecdotes um, ever. Um, this anecdote forms the basis, or, or is a metaphor, for what we are doing with healthcare also, and what can be done, what can, how you can get these delivery platforms to 5 billion people. And so my favorite ane anecdote, it's called the village of the pigs. And so a very close colleague of mine lives in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City uh, in Vietnam. And he has had for the longest time this very unnatural fascination with this region on the Vietnamese Laotian border that's completely restricted. It is foreigners or outsiders, um, even outside of Vietnamese, there is no way to get your foot in the door there. But he had also heard, listen, you know, this is such a poor area, um, people Literally, they, they have subsistence living, and the children have such high rates of malnutrition that actually the beautiful black uh, Vietnamese hair isn't black anymore. The beautiful black Vietnamese hair is almost like mine, or it was at least brown. And so he was very, very um, intrigued, trying to go and at least have a look. And so wherever he asked, please, can you give me um, permission visitors pass, everywhere the doors remained shut. The area is off limits to all. Um, he decided to then give up going the official route. Uh, basically, he realized there was a river flowing through the region he wanted to go, rented his own private boat. Um, and of course, with the tropical jungle on the side, there are lots of hidden ears and eyes. And so news of his unauthorized travel um, traveled far ahead of him. And so when he got to the place where he wanted to be, of course, an army patrol was awaiting him and he was uh, taken into custody. And eventually, and he's quite a blackguard, um, and so he managed to actually tell the army chief, listen, you know, I am actually, I just want to come and have a look. I just want to help you. And I'm this very well-known philanthropist from Saigon. And, and if I just can have a look, I'll, I'll try to help your people. And so the Army chief didn't fully necessarily um, trust it, but at the same time relented and allowed him to uh, under guard go and have a look. And now if you, the moment you look at that region, you realize there is one road, and it's kind of like a dirt road. Um, on the side of this road, you have one line, on each side, you have one line of houses. With houses, I mean, Places where people and their animals together live in that are made out of straw, out of wood, and out of corrugated iron, that is a house. Now, beyond those two lines of houses, there was jungle. There was nothing else. And the reason is because the whole area is stuffed with landmines. So people can't actually go and do farming. They, they 
they had no way of making money. They was, it was completely subsistence living, and it was a barter society. And the children, indeed, they did have brown hair, almost blondish hair. Um, so he looked around. Um, the army chief was still looking at him, ready to just take this guy and basically lock him up for some time. Um, and he asked him, well, you know, please can you ask the government representatives in this region, the representatives of the people, of the community, what would you like? And so they looked at him and said, all right, um, maybe you can give us a cow because we'd like the milk, we'd like the protein. The lack of protein is what was causing the children's hair to basically go brown and blonde. Um, and he looked at him and said, you know, um, a cow, you don't have fields, a cow needs grass, so this is never going to work. No. Um, then he says, do you have another idea? They say, well, how about a goat? And he says, well, you know, goats, they go jumping around, um, yes, they give milk, but the moment they hit the jungle behind you, they're going to ex explode to pieces because they step on these landmines. Um, you have another idea? And they say, yeah, how about a pig? And he thought about it, and then he realized, you know, um, they have these Vietnamese pot belly pigs. Um, they have, they're very easily domesticated, so the people can continue to live with their animals in their homes. Um, they have very high litter, litter rate, so it's very frequently making little ones. And on top of it, George Clooney has one also. So he basically said, you know, um, okay, let's make a deal. And my deal with you, um, and the region's actually quite big, and my deal with you is, I will come back in one month, and with me, I will bring 100 pigs, um, and I will loan them to the first 100 families. They are not a gift, they are a loan. And, for, and the conditions are such, you can use those pigs for the next 12 months. You can do anything you want with them, except for eating them and selling them, because I'm coming to get them back. I'm coming back in 12 months. And the second condition is that you actually, when you have a litter, you have to give another piglet to a family that doesn't yet have one. And so they agreed to it. Uh, he went back to uh, Saigon. Um, the plan happened, was carried out. And the families, were, some of them were so happy when the pigs arrived, they had created uh, little homes for the pig within their own home, etc., etc. Um, and so six months afterwards, he received a call from the army chief, who by now was his big friend. And the guy told him, oh, you really have to come back. You have to take a look. And he thought, oh, you know, all my pigs, they, for sure, they've been sold, they've been eaten. What has happened to those? I've probably lost them all. But no, it wasn't. The army chief told him, no, 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 no. You really have to come and look. This is pig city. Um, we have so many pigs, we have no idea what to do with them. There's pigs everywhere. And so eventually he went back, actually, to get his own pigs back. And when he arrived in pig city... Um, he realized there were indeed pigs everywhere, and the kids didn't have brown hair anymore. Their hair was black, because now they actually had enough pigs to where they, had, they could eat the animals also. And the most striking thing was, in the middle of the road, there was a big truck with a Laotian license plate, and the truck by now was filled with pigs also. So the people from Laos had heard about this massive oversupply of pigs on the other side of the border, had driven there, um, bought up as many pigs as they possibly could, still the region still had plenty left, paid to people in cash, and all of a sudden, almost overnight, although 12 months is not quite overnight, but almost overnight, this barter society turned into its own little economy and has been growing ever since. And now this is a metaphor for setting up sustainable primary health care uh, delivery platforms for 5 billion people that are not based in charity. Because charity doesn't work. It has never worked before. It's never going to work in a million years either. Um, if you do not have the primary healthcare delivery platforms, um, you cannot combat any epidemic. Not an old one, not a new one. Um, not an infectious disease one, not a chronic disease one. And that is to us my 1,700 volunteer um, medical experts, the 5 billion people 
um, over four continents on the planet. And to myself, that to us is the biggest question and the biggest challenge. And thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. Um, yes, your, your pigs are fascinating. You don't have any at home, do you? you no, no. No? OK, fine. The George Clooney uh, example. Um, how do you... I understand your point about sustainability, and, and I'm sure everyone would, would agree that setting up sustainable uh, systems of, of not only healthcare but of... Uh, the economy of, of food, agriculture are, are vital. But when you are faced with, say, a, an emerging uh, pandemic like HIV AIDS or you're dealing with malaria or any of the, the great uh, global disease threats, um, we do have a tendency to rely on um, the, the great uh, government organizations and NGOs uh, coming, UNICEF, the WHO, and all the, the billions of dollars that are spent um, every year on, on trying to tackle the immediate threat that's, that, that's facing the, the peoples of the developing world. How, how would you shift the focus very, very simply? I mean, it's, it's obviously pigs is one way, but I mean, do you think we need to tweak the way in which we, we deliver support to, to Africa and Asia? Oh, um, absolutely. I think right now, at a personal level, um, I think that NGOs and nonprofits, um, a lot of it, 99% of it, it's a self licking lollipop. Uh, we don't empower it, um, the local people. We do not give them the structures where they can take charge of their own uh, life, basically. And you know, with those um, uh, healthcare delivery platforms, the ones that I'm talking about, and we're actually rolling them out. Vietnam, China, Russia um, are coming. The way they turn the whole system that exists now, a lot of it has been set up by NGOs, um, upside down, they basically, they stop the brain drain of the local doctors, the brain drain internally in those countries where the local doctors are basically saying, you know, I make much more money if I'm not a doctor, if I go and drive a taxi or run a restaurant, and I'm happy to do that instead of being a physician. Um, they also stop the brain drain, people coming here to the UK, nurses, doctors, because life here is better. Here they can actually afford to support their families. There they can't, not with what they're making. But if you create a system for them where basically, yes, they have um, an income that is good enough for them and um, to feed their families, and yes, they're standing in society because they're now becoming well-educated, they're standing in society does remain high, and yes, all the patients have access to uh, affordable quality health care. Okay. I think you'd go a long way. Okay. Marie, thank you.